Hello everyone and welcome here to our first uh, AQPS talk for the fall 2018 semester. Today we have doctoral candidate Fallon Thompson presenting on introduction to CFA in M+. And this is going to be the first talk in our series of the academic year. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Fallon and let her have the show. Thank you, Dr. Tillin. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Welcome. Um, so if you have any questions, just make sure you ask them at the end of this talk. So let's begin. Um, so there are two research or two examples here that shows you what a research question or research hypothesis looks like for CFA. Um, so for CFA, the overarching hypothesis or, or question is, does my hypothesized measurement model fit the data? Okay, so it's just wanting to know what the model fit is for your data. Um, and so that's a more general question. And here is, um, below that is more a specific or real life question. So does the five factor model from NEO fit the data? Okay, so that's what you would have your research question phrase for a CFA framework. Now, what is a CFA? CFA is used to verify or confirm a hypothesized measurement model. Um, so a measurement model is just um, looking at the relationship between your latent variables and your indicators. And latent variables are also known as factors. And so those are your unobserved variables. Um, they're represented by the construct itself. Um, and the indicators are your unobserved or your observed variables and those are also called manifest variables um, and so they tend to be used to measure the latent variables so take for instance our example on our previous slide with the um, five factor um, model for personality so for personality methodologists are hypothesizing that it has five factors and they are uh, hypothesizing that 30 items for that scale measure uh, the five factors and so those 30 items are are being affected by those five factors and those items are your indicators And indicators are, so there's two aspects of indicators. They can be um, items on a scale or scores on an instrument. Um, so before we get to the next slide, I do want to note that this is not an exploratory factor analysis. And here are a few um, examples as to why it isn't, or they aren't the same. So for exploratory factor analysis, the focus is on exploring the data. And it's the data that will then drive your model, okay? Whereas for confirmatory factor analysis, it's, for, it's used for um, testing your hypothesis. So if you have a hypothesis and you wanna test it, use CFA, okay? If you don't know the factor structure, then you would use EFA. Um, and vocality between the two is different. So for an EFA, the items are free to load on all of the factors, whereas for the um, CFA, the items are specifically able to load on specific factors. And how you phrase your research question will be different as well. So for an EFA, um, you want to know the dimensionality of your scale, okay? But again, for CFA, you want to know, does this 
hypothesized model fit my data? So here's a visual of what a forced two-factor EFA and a two-factor CFA model looks look like. So on your left, you will see an EFA model, and this is just showing the difference of the locality between the two. So as you can see on your left, for the EFA, the factors, both factors, are affecting the indicators or the items. Whereas for the CFA, the um, one factor is, is affecting certain indicators and the other factor is, is affecting the other indicators, okay? So um, certain indicators are being loaded on certain factors for the CFA. So in your output, you would get a set of information. Um, so for latent factor and indicator, those are just notations and labels. And the latent factor are your two factors. And those are the big circles or ovals. Um, and the indicator is represented by the Y in this case. And those are your boxes. Um, Factor pattern loadings are your lambdas between the path or the path between the factor and the indicators. And factor pattern loadings is the strength of the effect of the factor onto the indicator. Um, and latent factor covariance is the long um, double arrow between the two factors. And that's just looking at the strength between, uh, looking at the strength of the relationship between the two factors. Then you have the small double arrows, and those are your small fees that indicate the variance of each factor. So error, error variances, uniquenesses is the um, the error terms that are at the bottom, and they're affecting the indicator. So those are your un unexplained variability and it's the variance that, of, that is, um, it's the variance of the indicator that is unexplained by the factor. Okay, so that's the information you would gather from a CFA output. So what are some of the steps for performing a CFA? First, just make sure that you have your data cleaned and ready to be analyzed, and that goes for any analysis you do, okay? Next is model specification, and under that is model identification. I'll talk more about that later. Estimation of model parameters, um, and then the next step is examine model fit. Those will also be talked about in the following slides. Um, Four is respecification of the model. So this one has a lot of, um, not, I don't know if it's a lot, but there's some controversy with this particular step because some methodologists say, yeah, go for it. You can respecify your model as long as it has a theoretical basis. However, there's other uh, methodologists who say, don't do it ever. Um, it's not good because it's exploiting your data. And um, so if, you know, if you're respecifying your model for that specific sample, it may not work for other uh, populations and other samples. And so it will not be able to be replicated. And the fifth one is um, make sure you examine parameters and report your findings. Okay, so we have an example here, and we, um, for this talk, we're using national, the National Financial Wellbeing Survey, and we're using a sample of um, 62 year olds and under adults. Um, so they actually gathered. Um, data from 5,000 people. However, three, three did not complete the survey. 
And so we were able, were able to analyze 4,997 participants. So this is what the 10 item financial well-being scale looks like. As you can see, some of the items here are in red and those that are in red have R's at the end. And that just means that those items are recoded because they're negatively phrased. And we recoded the items before we analyzed the data. <laughs> so, um, the first six items of this scale were used and, well, all ten were used, but the first six had a different set of response options than the last four, okay? And both are on a liquor type scale, a five-point liquor type scale. So, um, model specification and identification. So, modest model specification, um, basically in layman's terms, is drawing your model, okay? So, you're drawing your model to, um, or based on theory. Um, and so, there are a few things that a CFA specifies in the model, okay? Um, so, according to theory, it, you will specify the number of factors. Is it a one-factor model or a five-factor model, okay? Also, um, you would see whether or not you should correlate those factors, okay? Again, that's based on theory. And you'll um, be able to specify which indicators are loaded onto which factors. So in our example, we hypothesized that the financial well-being factor or um, scale is a one-factor solution, okay? So how do we specify that? Um, the number of factors, one, one factor. That's our hypothesis. Um, should we allow the factors to correlate? That doesn't apply to us because we only have one factor, okay? And which indicators slowed on, on which factor? Again, that doesn't apply to us because all of the indicators will load on that one factor. So we've specified it. Model identification. So model identification is when you have um, the number of um, pieces of information that is more than a number of the parameters in your model. So for M plus or any software to identify your model, um, you wanna make sure that, that um, you're able to, sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself. So identif that identification of your model relies on the number of indicators you have on, on each factor, okay? Um, but I did want to say that M plus cannot run if the model isn't identified, okay? Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, so for this slide, here are some guidelines or rules for model identification, and this will show you whether or not your model is identified. So they're saying that you need at least three indicators per factor that's, un that's uncorrelated. Um, and you need at least two indicators that loads on one factor that is correlated with another factor. And it assumes uncorrelated errors and there's no cross loadings, okay? So in reality, if you look at depression or self-esteem or self-efficacy, those three factors, um, it wouldn't make sense for those three factors to be measured by one indicator, okay? Or even three at times. So for our example for financial well-being, it's, um, measured with 10 indicators, OK? 
Okay. And this is what our um, model looks like visually. So we have the FWB for financial well-being and the um, indicators, the 10 indicators or the 10 items that are loaded. And then you have your, your error terms. So for fun, what we did was um, look at a two-factor model with the same scale, okay? So we have FWB1 and FWB2, and we're saying that they both correlate. So what we did was divided the items um, for FWB1 and FWB2. So if you can remember, the first six items had their own um, set of response options. And then the last four had their own set of response options. And so that's how we divided the two factors. Um, so for factor metric, since we know that latent variables are um, unobserved variables, they have no metric, they have no measurement scale. So in order for us to achieve this, we would need to fix the loading of one factor per, or one, the loading of one item per factor to one, okay? And N plus does that by default. Or we can fix the, um, we can fix the variance factors to one, okay? So this is what that looks like on um, an M, M plus. And this will be in the in the input file. So for here, you see it says factor one by the um, the items, okay. And so automatically, N plus is fixing that first loading of the item for identif for identification of the model. So next is estimation of model parameters. So these are a few common estimators. Um, you would decide which estimator to use based on the type of data you have, okay? So if you have continuous data, you would then use maximum likelihood if it assumes multivariate normality. <coughs> Um, if you have continuous data that is useful when multivariate normality is tenable, then you would use robust maximum likelihood or MLR for short and means and variance adjusted weighted least squares or WLSMV if you have ordinal data. Um, and in our case, we would use WLSMV because we have categorical data and which is on a Likert type scale, okay? And this is also this also can be used with um, dichotomous data. So here is an example of our input for our one factor CFA. So in our input file, it has the title, and we just named it FWB one factor CFA. Okay. Um, so these are the variable, the variable names. The variable names are your items for that factor. And if you can see, the use variables are that has the reverse coded um, items. And we're telling M plus that our missing data is coded negative one and negative four. So the define here is how we recode it the items that were negatively phrased. So um, we re recoded them. So say for instance, if there was a value of one, we recoded it to five. If there was a value of two, we recoded it to four, okay, and so forth. So down here for our, our model, um, it's a one factor. So, solution, okay? So the one factor by the variables or the items, okay? And it's categorical 
because we use a liquor type scale, okay? And so we specify that our model is, um, is going to use the estimator WLSMV. So next is examine model fit. Um, so these are just some guidelines for examining model fit. Depending on who you cite, it might be different, okay? The cutoffs might be different. So to, to assess for exact fit, we tend to use the chi-square p-value, and we want that to be non-significant for exact fit, okay? If it's significant, then you don't have exact fit. Um, and so if it is significant, then you want to check for approximate fit. And here are your approximate fit indices, standardized root mean, square residual, or SR, SRMR, or SRMR. Um, and you want those to be less than 0 0.08 for, for approximate fit. Root, root mean square error of, of approximation, or RMSEA, um, you want that to be less than 0 0.06 and Tucker-Lewis index or comparative fit index, you want those values to be um, more than 0.96 for approximate fit. So according to Asparov and Mutane in their 2018 paper, they say that um, if you have a Zach fit, um, then you're good, okay? So exact fit, if the p-value is uh, more than 0.05, um, and that's regardless of, regardless of SRMR. Um, but if it is significant, then check for approximate fit. And so you need to make sure that the SRMR is less than 0.08 and the standardized residuals are all small, okay? And that just means if the standardized residual correlations are less than 0.1, according to Klein. If you have a significant p-value for chi-square and if your value for SRMR is above 0.05, then you have poor fit, okay? And you can conclude that your model does not fit the data. So let's look at the fit indices for our one factor model. That will be the title that you will see. So we see that for our chi square p value is significant. So we don't have, we haven't achieved exact fit. Um, and just for fun, because actually we're going to use Asparov and Mutane's 2018 paper to assess model fit. So um, the RMSEA, this estimate is showing us that it's not, we haven't achieved approximate fit because it's above 0.06. And for CFI and TLI, those two values are below 0.96, okay? So we haven't achieved approximate fit. However, using Asparov and Mutane's um, guidelines for model fit, we see here that it is below 0.08, so we have achieved approximate fit. So let's look at the re, uh, residual correlations. So all of our items are below one, are below 0.1 except for this one. However, um, we can conclude that it's approximate fit because it's just a little over 0.1 and it's just one item, okay? So do we want to respecify our, our one factor model for FWB, financial well-being? No. So let's examine our parameters. So this is showing you the factor loadings. And they're looking good. They're high, um, and they're ranging from 0.66 to, 
to 0.83. And they're all significant. So this is an example of how you would write up the data analysis. Um, so you would write what analysis you, you uh, performed, on what scale, and you would write out um, what fit indices you decided to use, um, and then cite whose guidelines you decided to use. Um, so yeah, this is just an example. And then this is how you would write a um, something about your, your results. Okay, so that 35 um, next to the chi square is your degrees of freedom. Um, so yeah, these are the results we found from our output of N plus. Okay, so let's examine our two-factor CFA model. Basically, in the input, everything we did for the one factor, we would do for the two factor. The only difference is the model because we have two factors. So factor one by the items that load on that factor. And then factor two is by the items that load on that particular factor. Okay, um, and automatically N plus will correlate those two factors. So here is our model fit results. Again, our chi-square p-value is, is significant, and so we don't have exact fit. Um, RMSEA is telling us we don't have it because it's below, um, or it's above, sorry, 0 0.06. But again, we're not using that um, index, and we're not using CFI and TLI index to um, examine model fit, but we're just looking at it for fun. Um, so CFI and TLI are both um, below 0.96, so that's not telling us we've achieved approximate fit. However, SRMR is telling us we did because it's below 0.08. So let's look at our residual correlations. Um, the majority of the correlations are below 0.1. However, we do have four that are a little above 0.1, but we can still conclude that uh, we, have, we have achieved approximate fit. And our factor pattern loadings are looking good. They're high, um, all are significant, so those factor loadings are between 0.67 and 0.86. So we have a pretty good model. And the correlation between the factors is 0.92. So they're highly correlated. So um, how much data do we need to collect us? you know, um, data for CFA or to analyze the data for CFA. So a lot of scholars are saying just make sure your um, sample size is large enough so that you'll be able to analyze your, your data with a CFA model. Um, and then there are some specifics here. So some authors are saying at least have 250 or um, 300 participants in your study and other research is saying that make sure your um, sample size is dependent on the complexity of your model um, and others just suggest that at, at least five times the number of parameters okay so at least five at least um, the sample size should be five times the number of your estimated parameters. So just make sure you have a large sample size and it'll be all well. So any questions? How do you choose between the one factor and the two factor?
So it's based on theory. Um, so take for instance with self-efficacy, um, there's four sources of self-efficacy. So there's four factors. And if you want to, um, if you want to test that particular hypothesis, then you would then specify your model as having four factors and the um, indicators loading on each factor according to the items for that factor. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything to add about that? So it's, it's, a good, it's a good learning point where you have a one-factor model that fits the 10-item financial well-being scale, and you have a two-factor model that also fits the financial well-being scale. It looks at first as if the two-factor model should be the one you want to choose. However, this is where theory and your logical argument from a validity perspective should come into play. So it's very possible for many models to fit your data. And then you have to decide, what do I choose? This is where you need to have sound theory, literature, and research to make that argument. Otherwise, you're letting the data drive your hypothesis. If you had an intention to ask the question, does a two-factor model fit my data better than a one-factor model, you could go down that path. However, knowing this instrument and its utility, right, and how it was developed, it was developed for a single score to measure one thing being financial well-being. Looking at the results, we would focus on the one-factor model. The two-factor model here is presented just for example's sake. So this is where you need to know your theory you need to know how to make your logical argument and how to stop it and not go beyond. Just to add as well, if you look back at that two-factor solution, by many standards, people would argue that they're so highly related. Probably one single entity mm -hmm. known as financial well-being. Mm -hmm. yeah. there any more questions? Nice job. Yeah.